you'll get a little pop up that says something. So go ahead and accept that. The second thing is that we do have live transcription for this event today, and you will be able to find the transcription on um, the, the bottom of your screen where it says live transcription. You just have to enable that and say show transcript. Um, so you'll be able to follow that through the session if you'd like to have that with you as well. So a little bit about us. Um, we're really excited for today's conversation with Manal and you'll find out in a little bit as to why that is the case. Um, but um, Metamorphosis, which is the organization that put this together, we started this organization, Arthi and I, who you also see on the screen, um, started this organization during the pandemic in 2020. And we realized that there was a bit of a gap um, and we needed to create a space for people to start talking about some of the the lines that were blurring between the professional and the personal. So it started really as uh, just Arthi and I wanting to bring people together to have a conversation about their experiences. And so that kind of evolved into something else. And now it is a full-fledged platform with uh, small events and programs that we run. Uh, but the mission of Metamorphosis is really to bring people together to share stories um, to build community and to exchange resources so that we can build a more equitable, inclusive, and empathetic uh, society and community. Unmentionables, which is the series that you're a part of today, um, again, came out of a conversation that we were having. Um, and we found that while we all do a lot of work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, there was a bunch of topics that we were not willing to get into or not willing to talk about. And so we decided, hey, let's start that conversation. And so we started Unmentionables with the idea that we would talk about taboo topics at work or in society and just you know, start having a conversation about it and see what comes out from those conversations and see whether we could share some resources with people um, who are joining us or who are co-creating some of those resources with us. Uh, so we are now, we've now, this is I think our fourth session. We've done a couple of sessions on the topic of privilege, jokes, and also DEI practitioners experiencing fatigue um, just through the role that they're, they're playing on a daily basis. So that's a little bit about metamorphosis as well as unmentionables. I'll share a little bit about myself and then I'd like Arthi to share a little bit about herself before we actually introduce Manal and get the session started. But um, my name is Pooja Shahani and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm based in Bangalore in India. I'm originally from Hong Kong, started my career as a journalist and then moved on and did many other things before I ended up uh, working in the diversity, equity and inclusion space, both as a consultant as well as in-house in an organization. Um, so my last sort of gig was with Goldman Sachs here in Bangalore, setting up their diversity and equity and inclusion strategy. And then I decided, hey, I need to step back um, and again, rethink what we're doing as, as a practitioner in this space. And so I stepped back and now do a bunch of tiny little things in the diversity, equity and inclusion space, our work with metamorphosis, which we'll share again a little bit about later at the end and some coaching. So that's a little bit about me. Over to you, Arthi. Thank you, Pooja, and thanks everyone who could join us today. Um, quick introduction about me. I'm a work psychologist by training and practice. So that means I've had the fun of applying psychology to all kinds of things work related. Um, I, like Pooja, we've been working in the DEI uh, space for a while now, and I this is the first time I'm actually doing this introduction. I recently started a job as a DEI solutions consultant at YSC Consulting. So prior to that, I was doing uh, running my own independent consulting practice. And that's how that's when Pooja and I started working together in this space. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and I'll ask Pooja to introduce our special guest today. <laughs> Yeah, before we do that, actually, since we're a few people, yeah, uh, we were wondering whether um, you could tell us a little bit about yourselves, maybe just your name, uh, your pronouns, where you're based, maybe where you're calling in from today, and, uh, you know, why are you here today? So anyone can go first. If you want to use the chat, that's open too. You can just um, share your response via chat, or you can unmute yourself and share a little bit. Um, 
so that we can at least hear your voice. Okay, I can go first. Hi everyone, good evening. Uh, my name is Meghna. So I go by she, her pronouns and I am the founder of Trustin. So we've built a solution for combating workplace sexual harassment. And currently I'm based in Bangalore. I'm very excited to be here. This is the first time, although I've wanted to make it for previous sessions and I really like the topic. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, thanks Meghna. Anyone else? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Uma. Hi, Uma. Um, I have uh, been for one of your sessions before this. I just found the topic interesting, so I joined in. I work in the field of education, actually. So, um, yeah. Uh, but my organization, we did, we do have this uh, Vishakha committee, and as uh, part of that, so really, I'm interested in what you're talking about. Um, yeah, uh, that's it. I I do plan. Uh, I didn't think the video would be on, so I'm not here as often. <laughs> thank you for thank you for turning the video on, so that at least we can interact in this way. But thank you so much for yeah. joining us. Yeah. It's a good fun. I mean, I uh, really we learned a lot in the last one, so I thought I'd see what it there today. Okay, I'm looking forward to the talk. The thank you. Thanks, Christy. I see that you've um, left us a little message. Oh, sad for the tree though. <laughs> okay, so we'll get started. Um, please, if you'd like to continue to share with us on chat a little bit about yourself, um, that would be great. So without sort of delaying any further, I'd love to welcome Minal um, to this conversation with us here today. We met, we've been watching Minal's work for a while, but I think we only really started to engage with Minal earlier this year. Um, through our Metamorphosis Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Changemakers program. And when we sort of had this conversation with her about what we wanted to talk about, the session was all good, was going to be about communicating and framing DEI work and DEI strategies. But the conversation that we had with our cohort and her was so broad and we covered so many different topics. And one of the things that we covered was capitalism and sometimes how at some point of time, does it, be, does it become, um, does capitalism as a framework within which our organizations and societies are built, does it at, at times sort of uh, conflict with diversity, equity, and inclusion? And there was one word that she um, mentioned there, which I continue to think about till now, is this idea of predatory capitalism. And so we'll get to hear a little bit about that from her. Um, if you want to learn more about Manal, you can definitely go and read her bio. We're, we don't do introductions like that. So our introduction to Manal is really um, why we're inspired by her. And one of the things that we're really inspired by is her ability to be really honest with a lot of simplicity. Um, and I, I know honest is a really simple word to use, but being honest and cutting through all the layers of bullshit is really hard and we love <laughs> the way that she's just able to do this. And we're really inspired by that. So Manal, thank you so much for being here with us today uh, through all your, your different sort of schedules that you have. Um, and we're really excited to hear from you. So I'll pass it over to Arthi to kind of take it over and start this conversation. Thanks, Pooja. Thank you indeed. And uh, yes, we are so excited because we're fans. We're also reading your book and we were talking earlier before you all joined how I feel like highlighting every sentence because I <laughs> want to remember it and come back to it. <laughs> so uh, we thought we'd do this uh, in what we call a Rubaru format. So those of you who are from India might have heard this word before or this term. So Rubaru really actually refers to a face-to-face -face conversation, but we also like it because the word Ru in uh, Hindi and Urdu means soul. So we want to connect soul to soul. So like Pooja said, cut through the bullshit <laughs> and the layers. So in the Rubaru, we have planned a few questions to ask you. We've integrated some of the questions that came in from those who registered. So some of you are here, some of you are not, but I've tried to create a list that covers all of those. So let me launch straight into it, Minal. Um, 
And the very first thing we want to know is, tell us about the book. Why did you feel like you had to write this book? You've been working in this space for a long time, but why now and why this book? Yeah, thank you, Arti. Thank you, Arti and Pooja for having me. I'm so honored to be here and so thrilled to be speaking to um, my colleagues in India and in Asia Pacific. Like this has been a dream to get to connect with people doing this work globally. Um, and so the, I am as eager to be here as anybody else. Um, and yeah, that's a great question. Why did I write the book? Um, I'm a natural writer. So I think writing is how I figure things out and how I process things and how I get to the heart of things. So I think writing was not an option, but as for this book, uh, the first story in chapter one sort of sets up why I wrote the book because my husband is a firefighter and paramedic here in the States. He's a white American. He works um, in a fire department that actually is fairly diverse because we're in a metropolitan area. Uh, but he tells his story about uh, three fire captains who went to a diversity conference. And during the conference, one of the facilitators mentioned L LGBTQ. And the captain was like, what does Q stand for? And the facilitator said queer. And the captain's response was, are you kidding me? I literally got called onto the carpet 10 years ago for using that word at the firehouse. And the facilitator, I suspect and hope, explained how queer had been re, um, like sort of reappropriated by the LGBT community. And uh, you know, the meaning has sort of changed. It's no longer sort of used as a slur. All of that fell on deaf ears because when the captain got back to the firehouse, his one takeaway from this three-day diversity conference was, guys, we can say queer now. And I was just like, oh, that's what they're taking away when we have these very esoteric abstract conversations about um, inclusion and equity. And when we put it at the level of like an academic paper, and I wanted to write something that would translate it out of abstraction into something much more concrete. And I wanted to make it accessible because I get concerned when, if we can only talk at that level, then we're sort of subtly implying that you need to have a graduate level education in order to be inclusive in the world. And that is just fundamentally not a scalable response to the problems that we're having. So I wanted to, make it much more accessible so that we could start to scale this work. Thank you. And you certainly have succeeded. Um, and actually that fits right into our quest here, right? We called this series Unmentionables with yeah. the intention of let's start mentioning these unmentionables. Let's make that accessible. Let's make that yeah. sort of understood or at least have these conversations. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about the unmentionables you've come across in your work that you yeah. may have dealt with in the book. Uh, what are some real controversies? What are people pushing back against with mm -hmm. the work you do? Yeah. Um, so it, it depends from which side, right? Because mm. I think they're really, to be good at DEI, I think really requires walking that middle path and so you can really kind of upset people on both sides so i think um on one side of the equation like when we're talking about equity we're really talking about power money and time and people don't like talking about any of those things like they definitely don't like talking about power or money and time they sort of will talk about but only in terms of time management not in any real way but then on the other side i think when it comes to equity and inclusion um you know, I think there's some things that are really difficult for DEI practitioners to talk about, like the fact that like inclusion is not about making, like it's not about making everybody happy or like giving everybody what they want. It's about values-based decision-making. And so you can still have disappointment and hard conversations in an inclusive space. And I think that really scares um, some DEI practitioners because that can, if you say it's not about making people happy, people can then use it to continue to oppress and exploit people, right? So it's a very tricky um, uh, space to occupy. And then equity, 
I actually think, I mean, I write in, in the book that like, you know, equity seems to be the middle child in DEI, but like the idea we all skip over. And I've heard DEI practitioners define it wrong and like talk about it. And I was like, equity has nothing to do with how you feel. Equity is all about the system and whether you have a fair shot. And so I think all of those topics, power, money, time, equity, and inclusion are, are um, either people are afraid to talk about them or don't know how to talk about them authentically or intelligently uh, or in, you know, innocent questions are shamed very quickly. Um, and so I, I really love that you called this the unmentionables because there's a wonderful, um, there's a woman, her last name is McFarland. I think her first name is Margaret, Margaret McFarland, who worked with Fred Rogers for years, for decades. And she used to say anything mentionable is manageable. So if we can just talk about it, then it becomes easier to like face it and um, de design solutions and to really start to work on some of these things. That's fantastic. And yes, we, we do believe uh, that is the intention behind unmentionables, right? So we can start talking about it and managing it eventually. Um, I love also that you picked up on those three things, the power, money, time, yeah. and couple of those especially relate to the theme for today, power and money, at least in my mind, and for sure time. You speak, yeah. you write about overwork, for instance, in your mm -hmm. book. So tell us a little bit about how those relate to capitalism in particular yeah. and why we picked this theme. I think we came up with it together, but you really sort of yeah. came up with the title. So tell us why. Yeah, so... Um... It's really, so I think capitalism is getting, um, is sort of a, really an interesting concept to talk about. Um, in the anti-racist space, there is a movement for anti-capitalism, uh, which I get, and which as someone who is the daughter of Indian immigrants to this country, I, I sometimes question. And, and the reason for that is, I, I don't believe in any way that capitalism is the panacea for all the world's problems and should be applied to all problems the way it has. I think that's inherently problematic. And I say that because both my parents were physicians. My, you know, my father never advertised that he was a doctor because he's like, we don't advertise for people to be sick. That's just, th this is a service, right? And I'm a big believer that education and healthcare should be socialized, but, my parents also came to this country because India had a socialized economy right after independence. And their opportunities as people who came from like really humble backgrounds were, they studied in Pune, but they were not Maharashtran. Um, my mother's from Punjab, my father's from Kurg. Uh, and so they, they weren't Brahmin by any means either. So they weren't connected in order to work that sort of socialized economy in a way to have an opportunity. They also had, had to elope. And so that was a further way in which they would have been excluded in society. And so that's why they eventually came here to this country. And so when people sort of present socialism as the anecdote, as the, as the um, antidote for, um, for capitalism, my red flags go up too, right? Uh, so I'm not anti-capitalist. However, what I've observed both in the US and all my time here and from what's been happening in India through the introduction of a capitalist um, economy, which has helped in a lot of ways, but both countries are leading towards what I call predatory capitalism. Um, and, and um, you know, predatory capitalism is really about exploiting and dividing and conquer conquering, right? It is, um, a form of supremacist power, right? So the so there's a lovely book called The Power Manual by Cindy Suarez. And she lays out how there's really two forms of power, supremacist power and liberatory power. And supremacist power is about taking more than one share. And that's what I see happening in the US and in India and across the globe. This idea that we should hoard, that we should can always grow and always scale and that's not possible. Like we've run out of planet, clearly. Um, a liberatory approach to power is about relationships and, um, and Edgar Villanueva in Decolonizing Wealth says this very well. He's like, how can we use money as medicine? 
How can we use it to heal and our, repair our society to great, create a greater sense of belonging? And you know, the the counterweight to growth is not scaling down; it's sustainability. How do we create economic models that are sustainable in the long run, given that we have finite resources, right? And that even gets to time because the way that people talk about time is about time management, not in the acknowledgement that time is actually the most finite resource we have. You cannot make more of it no matter how rich and powerful you are. And so we need to have conversations about like, how are we gonna use people's time? That just because you're paid more doesn't mean that your company is entitled to more of your time, right? And that companies need to know that if you salary somebody, it doesn't mean you own them. That is a legacy of slavery. And I think in India, a legacy of the caste system, right? That you own your, your plantation workers or your servants or like there's like there's loans on servants in India, right? That like this idea of owning human beings um, is inherently oppressive and against a liberatory use of power. It is a supremacist use of power. Thank you very much. I think um, you've given us a lot of, uh, you know, things mentally I'm hyperlinking, like I want to go now and read more <laughs> from Cindy Suarez's work yeah. and so on. So thanks for that framing. Um, I'd love to drill down a little more, especially given one of the questions that came up from a registrant about this idea of oppression and exploitation specifically and taking it to the organizational level. So let's say, so this question was actually about um, building an equitable ecosystem as mm -hmm. an organization, especially when there's this um, movement to outsource labor, outsource labor, especially overseas, you know, for what was called cost arbitrage. I think that term fortunately has not been used in the last few years as much. Yeah. So yeah, so the idea is we exploit labor that's cheap. That yeah. is the business model. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's how a lot of companies have grown successful, including Indian companies. Let me also admit that right now. <laughs> uh, so yeah, what, what are your views on that when the whole business is founded on that model? How can yeah. they still create that equitable, sustainable ecosystem you're talking about? Yeah, so first, like we need to back up because... Mm -hmm. um, I talk in the book how equitable leaders have system sight. Mm. And when you start to see the system, you see the unconscious biases that are baked into the system. Mm. And one of the unconscious biases that seems to be fairly global mm -hmm. is that the default human being is straight, white, male, able-bodied, mm -hmm. right? Everything else is other and then pushed to the margins. And so why I bring that up is because the problem with arbitrage is the fundamental belief that people in other countries should be making less, right? Mm -hmm. Like the fact that, that we think that that is okay, that it's okay to exploit that is, is a form of racism, right? That we think that people working in factories in India don't deserve the same labor rights and benefits as a white American working in a factory in the US. That is a form of racism. And so the question then begins, first of all, why is that happening? Like we need to acknowledge that, mm. right? Why do you think that you can do that, right? Um, and then the second part of it is like for countries like India to be like, you can't do business here unless you treat us as well as you treat your American employees right like why are we allowing that you know and so that is a hard conversation I admit to have because mm. the, the because it's so ingrained this is like the predatory part of capitalism exactly. that we've been so socialized to believe we don't even question it mm. we don't even question that we should be going for profit maximization and that needs to be completely upended too mm. right what if we went for sustainability instead of profit maximization? What if we had a dual or triple bottom line where we measured social impact? How many of your employees are able to like put food on the table and send their kids to school and buy a house? 
What if that's your measurement of worth? Now that requires then, like if you're a public company, not all multi, or so if you're a multinational company and you're privately owned, you have some room to play there, right? You can create a dual or triple bottom line pretty easily. If you're a publicly traded company, it gets more complicated, right? Because the laws don't support that approach. Like in the US, there is a law that companies need to maximize shareholder value. So then arbitrage becomes like to not engage in arbitrage becomes actually negligent. Hmm. So like those are the policies that then have to be advocated for because those are policies that don't benefit all of humanity. They benefit a few of like the world's wealthiest. Hmm. Like we've basically codified and um, made it illegal to benefit all of humanity. Hmm. That is a depressing thought. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm hearing from what you're sharing so far, there's systems, right? There's systems within systems at the mm -hmm. highest level. I think some of these laws, these international trade mm -hmm. agreements, all of this, we need to really seriously think, um, rethink. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the folks that are responsible for that are the ones benefiting from these Inequities. Yeah, I know. Right? I was just listening to the radio about the mm. Pandora Papers, and it's like, oh, yeah. everybody, like everybody with the power to change that actually benefits from this corruption. Exactly. So when we're in such a system as that, then it can get really demoralizing. So then what we need to do is really do a power analysis. Like, what do we have the power to change? Mm. Right? We may not be able to change that whole system, at least not today. Um, but then multinational companies can begin to act, okay, let's say we just have to accept arbitrage. How can we at least do it in a way that we're still measuring how many of these workers are able to like send their kids to school and buy a home? Like, let's at least start measuring that. How many people's lives are actually improved by this job? And how can we start pushing on how much they're paid so that it's not the lowest wage possible, but, the, but a living wage that allows them to live in this country in a middle class way. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the very least, right? Do we even know, yeah. uh, do companies, do business leaders, for instance, even know what's in their supply chain? Mm -hmm. Who are they buying from? Who are they hiring? What communities are they impacting? And I think that's a lens that's relatively recent and relatively rare even now. Um, and by the way, I just wanna also let everyone know as Meenal and I are chatting. If there's any thoughts you're having, if you have any questions, yeah. please drop it in the chat or raise your hand. And um, we'll absolutely like, I'll stop in a couple of uh, <laughs> questions so we can open it up to a real Q&A, but don't let, don't hold yourself back. <laughs> so yeah, I was also, um, you know, to go back to what we just shared. So the systems within systems and all of this, the power dynamics, but I love what you said about, can we change the definitions of success you know, that multiple bottom line <laughs> idea. So it's not just profit maximization. Have you yeah. seen examples of that actually happening? Have you seen companies ready to embrace a new definition? Yeah. yeah. So there are some companies. So there is this thing called B Corp in the US. Hmm. It, it's kind of a, like the guy who invented it, I think makes a lot of money off of it. So it's a little bit problematic. Hmm. Um, I think that there are, are companies that are at least adopting it informally. I, I mean, Brevity and Wit adopts it informally. We're not a B Corp, we're not in no way official, but we're privately hold, held and um, our consultants get a much higher percentage of the, the billable rate than they do at any other consulting firm. Hmm. Like it is not for me to make, um, like to get rich off, it's for me to make enough money to support my family. Hmm but it's not for in, like profit or income maximization. That's not the purpose of our company. And we're privately owned. So when you work with privately held companies, th there's more control there to do this, hmm. right? The publicly traded ones, it's a little bit harder. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of talk about a dual or triple bottom line. I don't know how many have actually implemented it yet. I think I do have a friend at Patagonia and I think they're probably the most progressive in terms of at least uh, measuring environmental impact mm. and try and, and then actually starting to work on social impact as well. 
Yeah, I love Patagonia as an example. Pooja and I have been following Dan Price and Gravity yeah. Payments. <laughs> yeah. We're fans now. Oh, I think again, but it's small, it's private, it's you know, I think it's we still see the influence of the leader in both of these examples quite starkly. Yeah. Yeah, leadership matters a lot. This is what we mm. talk about in terms of power, right? Like mm. DEI in organizations is different than DEI in democracies. Yes. Like grassroots efforts aren't always going to work. Mm -hmm. You need to start with leadership because you can't vote out your CEO. So if your CEO isn't genuinely, authentically on board with this, you're going to just hit a wall eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, th that OD lens on DEI and really starting with leadership is really super critical because yeah, th those are the people who have the power. Absolutely. And I highlighted the part where you said you can't vote out your CEOs. <laughs> and that reminds me, if there's any point, Meenal, when you want to just read an excerpt or something, <laughs> please feel free. <laughs> oh, I see Camille has raised her hand. Yeah. Camille, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Camille. Camille, you are still on mute, so maybe you just have to unmute. Yes. All right, I'm asking to unmute. Okay. There you go. <laughs> I actually, I actually raised my hand by accident. But anyway, <laughs> since I'm on, hello, Manal, and I love your book. I'm reading it, and it's very informative. And thank you for um, this uh, meeting this morning. Thank you, Camille. It's so nice to see, well, not see you, but hear you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Did you have a question, Camille, or are you holding it for later? <laughs> no, I don't have a question okay. yet. Not yet. All right. Fair enough. Uh, so, Meenal, actually, when, you know, um, we were talking about countries and, you know, the... Uh, arbitrage and all of that, a related question had come up in the registered, uh, among the registered people. Um, and I'm going to read it exactly. So what advice do you have for multinational organizations with distributed offices to have a cohesive DEI strategy when DEI is so different for each country's reality? Yeah. Uh, and some topics are considered taboo. And we had a yeah. similar question around designing for unique cultural contexts. Yeah. So what advice do you have for our uh, two registrants around those? Yeah, so for this question, I actually rely on the people who came before me. Um, Rohani Anand, who is the CDO at Sodexo, has a new book called, uh, coming out called Leading Global Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And she talks, and she's worked at those multinational companies. And she talks about the first pillar is to actually make it local. Hmm like to make the interventions local um, and specific to the context there, right? And she talks about, I think like an example from Saudi Arabia, where we're trying to get women more recognition and how she had to go about it in a way that would not be acceptable here in the US, mm. but was effective in terms of getting women more recognition in the workplace, right? So it's really important, like all of DEI should be contextualized. Hmm. That's why there aren't like best, th there are best practices, but the best practices aren't prescriptive, hmm. right? Because each company is different. And so each, like, there, there are some general truths, but the context matters a lot for how DEI is implemented. All right. We might uh, push you to give us an example or two uh, <laughs> around how we might do that. And especially, so building on the design question, I know you go into that quite a bit in your book um, about the design principles and so on. So do you want to just summarize that for our listeners? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, there's a lovely principles. story there, I think that probably highlights this idea of contextualizing, right? So my friend Rajan Patel went to Stanford D School mm -hmm. and um, he, uh, he now runs an organization called Dent Education that teaches design thinking to Baltimore high school students and to people all over the world. And he's actually done a ton of work in India, teaching college students and um, new employees at like tech companies and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, but when Rajan was in Stanford as an undergrad, he was part of a cohort learning design thinking that paired them with uh, NGOs. 
And there was an NGO in India that wanted to address premature births. Because as I'm sure many of you know, um, premature births can be really dangerous in India because most people don't have access to an incubator or they're either because they're delivering at home or because they're in a hospital where the incubators don't work or there's no electricity, so on and so forth, right? So a lot of babies die from hypothermia, right? Um, and so they were working with this NGO to find a solution that is specific to the context in India. And what they did was engage in human-centered design, which has a number of phases. The first being empath like empathizing and doing interviews to understand the user experience. And when they went and spoke to moms in India whose baby was premature, if there, so often what they would happen is that there would be a number of premature babies and one would basically just win the lotto and get time in the incubator. But what they found when they spoke to the mother is that she was actually more anxious because her baby was separated from her right after birth. And for her, like this is like this huge machine that looks like it's gonna hurt her child. And so they then worked through the like process of design thinking of defining the problem, ideating, prototyping, to find a solution for uh, moms and for nurses and doctors that worked for the Indian context. And they created something called um, uh, the Embrace Warmer, which is like a swaddle unit with a heated wax pack in the back that allows moms to like hold their babies while they're being swaddled in this um, cloth incubator that keeps them at the ideal temperature, right? And so that is a solution that is contextually appropriate. What they didn't do was start a nonprofit that said, oh, we need to educate moms on why they should like be okay with the incubator. And we need to scale up the electricity grid across India to make sure that every incubator has access to electricity. They didn't try to take a Western solution and implant it into an Indian context. They designed for that context. And so DEI needs to be the same way. The solutions we come up with need to be um, designed for the context in which people are living and working. What I also love about that example uh, and a few others, right? You mentioned, for instance, texting that yeah. began you know, with a focus on those who, uh, yeah. you know, had special needs or, you know, a specific segment of the population, but look at all of us, our lives would not be the same today without texting. Uh, so we talk about the curb cut effect, right? That a design that was meant for maybe a small population, part of the population ends up benefiting everyone. Yeah. And we, we just love these examples and this, uh, the embrace, uh, Yes. What's it called? Embrace? The Embrace Warmer. And Warmer, actually now, yes. So the company that, Rajan has since left the, the company that they started, mm -hmm. but they, they have started actually marketing it for, to the U.S. as well. Exactly. Yeah. So it, I'm sure it's a low cost compared to like a full-blown incubator that sucks up all that electricity and space. Yeah. Uh, so such a elegant solution that can literally be exported now everywhere. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Camille, you, you raised your hand. Was this one on purpose? <laughs> yeah, this one, this one is legitimate. All right, so this, go ahead. This, this is kind of a, a long question and it's related to public policy. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so two things. One, I've, I've worked in transportation for a really long time. And one of the ways that we determine equity, and this is by federal regulation, um, when we're, we're making any changes to, let's, let's just say a service route, right? Who gets, trans, who gets a new router, who doesn't? And the formula that we are given is to compare minority and low income to non-minority and um, non-low income. And then you take the, the difference between the two and you set a threshold. And let's say the, the difference is over your threshold of 5%, then you determine, okay, there is, there is um, that decision is gonna make it inequitable, right? So people are going to either um, receive less of a benefit, low income and minority are gonna receive less of a benefit than other non-minority and low income. And my position has always been, that's a poor way to determine equity. 
right? If I wanted to determine equity, I would use more qualitative information to determine that. So what, what other elements do you think we need to use to determine equitably so that it truly is a measure of equity and not just a measure of percentages or numbers? Yeah, um, I will admit I didn't quite follow that equation fully. Okay. But if you're, if you're okay. asking, you know, um, what the, I mean, the equitable question is if we put um, low income people of color or, or marginalized folks at the center of our services, how would we go about giving them access to? Is it transportation or Wi-Fi, Camille? Transportation. How would we go about like designing a transportation system that put their needs at the center? Mm -hmm. That's okay. the, the question, right? Okay. Because so long as we're con like, and also I would, I, I'm sure this is your organization's language and not yours, but I would just like, so we're talking about op like, high income white people like we shouldn't be using the word non-minority they're white <laughs> right so, like or yeah. we, you know or are we talking about like any like so so the formula is to take so the formula is to take how many minority okay, right we are in the food in the house nobody and then any. compare them against the non-minority writers right Take yeah. the difference between the two. In terms of numbers. In terms of numbers of okay. who will be impacted. And yeah. then you can set your own threshold. It could be 5%, 10%. And let's say that difference exceeds, if that difference exceeds your threshold, threshold then there are going to be disparate treatment to your minority riders. If it doesn't exceed your threshold, then there, is, there are no disparities. And that's how we're told to measure. And I've always thought that was just a crazy measurement because it's it doesn't really tell you anything. Specifically, like in the Silicon Valley, where you have a minority population, we have a lot of minorities rather in this population that are very, very wealthy and that are very, very poor. So mm -hmm. then that number actually gets diluted and it doesn't really tell you the harm that low-income minorities will experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then it becomes a, a, a weighted number because you're, yeah. So like the outliers are, are throwing off the mean. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't go that much. Like I, I, I have not done work on like public policy metrics on like how we would measure that. But I do agree that generally there always should be quantitative and qualitative data used side by side because the qualitative helps make meaning out of that data. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it should be presented thus that like, this is what this actually means. This is a story mm -hmm. that highlights what's the impact of that. So um, I would probably have to look at it more to really understand what, um, whether that would be an equitable measurement, but it should never be used just as like one measurement. I mean, one yeah. measurement in general is a bad idea. Right. It's like saying yeah. that the healthiest person is the tallest person, like with no bearing on like weight or yeah. cholesterol or anything else. Right. Like that. Yeah. Makes no sense. So it should always be a ratio and it should always be quantitative and qualitative. Yep. OK. All right. Thank you. No Agreed. I would just also add, uh, I think quantitative measures actually uh, reflect or that's where you see the patterns of inequities, you know, with individual stories or qualitative anecdotes, mm -hmm. um, we might not actually be able to see the big picture um, revealed. Need, as that's easy. why you need yeah, both. We do right? need both. I we agree. Yeah. yeah. I know Deepa has got your hand up. Yeah. Go ahead, Deepa. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm going to turn. Hi, Deepa. <laughs> Hi, lovely to see so many known faces and lovely to have you, Minal. Wow, congratulations once again on the book. Thank you. It's so lovely to see you. So, Deepa and I are friends. So, it's so sorry. It was just nice to catch up. <laughs> I think I have a question which is a little like um, to do with the corpus because that's where I work the most and in the space of DEI. And it's going to be almost like a, like a question, like at a base level question that I need to ask. Um, 
see in india uh, we've started the journey or at least openly talking and um, actively doing some work in the space of diversity and inclusion probably in the recent past maybe about i've seen more action in the last three to four years than i have ever seen before uh, and what i have noticed is organically i've seen organizations uh, shift the name of their diversity and inclusion policy or the diversity and inclusion council to dei policy and dei council um, i'm still not very sure whether everybody is very sensitive or clear more than sensitive clear about what exactly goes into that and therefore i would just like to seek your input from a very indian context or from a from for people who are keen to know would like to be a part and make progress what is it that they should keep in mind as they include and embrace the e in d e n i yeah thank you deepa for that question um yeah i think a lot of people have even in the states people add the e but i'm not so like you know like i said at the beginning there are dei practitioners who i've heard describe equity poorly <laughs> if not incorrectly and i don't think that a lot of people have a, a true grasp on it um i'm trying to pull up uh this one image to show you all um yeah here we go let's see if i can do i share yeah yes yeah all right hold on first needs to come up all right, so this is in the book, actually. Um, it's the first figure in the book. And I think as much as I like words, I think this like visuals sometimes help explain concepts better than words, um, but I'll talk it through anyway. So that we have, um, so often equity, it, it helps to ground yourself in equity in knowing how it's different from equality. That being said, I just wanna make a caveat that both equality and equity are important and I'll explain why in a little bit. I'm not saying it's one over the other, but it, it, it helps to sort of clarify this. So this is a image from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and equality is that top line where everybody gets the same bicycle, right? And what you notice in that top line is that not everybody can use that bicycle. And even when they can use it, it's more of a struggle for some than others. Equity is when people get the resources they need to participate fully with, at the, with the same level of effort, right? Now, what's really the sort of gaslight like effect of this is that if you look at that top line and anybody can unmute themselves, like who is that bike actually originally created for? The woman, yeah, I saw Deepa like mouth it. <laughs> she wasn't on me. And so then what it like, and so often when I take teams through this, I was like, what's the bias that leads to that situation in the top line where some people are struggling more than others? What's the inherent assumption that we make or the bias that leads to that? And you can just unmute yourself and call out. I could just give it a shot. Yeah. So uh, it's probably that, and um, you know, I want to do something, and mm -hmm. this is something that I think would be good for everybody. Yeah. I and as an organization, I'm taking a step in that direction, and therefore, yeah. So I'm doing this, and I'm doing this for everybody. That's probably. yeah. Yeah. So like exactly, there's there is a good intent there, but the the assumption is that if I find a solution that works for one people. Let's scale this. It's the bias for scale that gets us into trouble. That we think, oh, we figured out one thing. We'll just, so this works for one human being. It'll work for all human beings because we can't talk about differences very well, right? And so then what really gets my goat is then when the people who cannot use the bicycle, um, such as the woman in the wheelchair, or the other people who are struggling more, such as the really tall man or the strong child, struggle, we tell them just pedal faster and harder. Just work harder and you'll get there. When the thing that they're using was never designed with them in mind in the first place. 
right? Like that's some serious gaslighting that we do, right? Like we go and we tell women, like if you just worked harder and like managed all these competing priorities, you would be successful as men. If you just asked for more money, you would make as much money as men. If you just had more confidence, you would make as much money, which is just such like bullshit. I can't even deal with it. It's such nonsense, right? And so equity is about saying, how do we give people the resources they need according to their differences in order to participate fully and contribute their strengths? Right now, that doesn't mean that equality is always the wrong answer. So equity should allow equal access to opportunity. There are times when equality is the right answer and giving everybody the same thing makes sense. And the, the best example of this in the States particularly is marriage equality. There was a movement in the 90s and early 2000s um, that some LGBTQ rights groups were going for civil unions. Um, and that that would have been a different form of domestic partnership than marriage. But they organized and they realized that marriage equality was the only thing that was really going to ensure the rights, um, their rights in perpetuity at the same level of heterosexual couples. And so sometimes the same thing, the same policy is the right answer for different groups, but sometimes different resources are needed for different groups to have equal access to opportunity. Does that answer that, Deepa, in a way that like makes sense? It does, it does. I think, I, I, you know, while, while I, I get, you know, this understanding, this is good and very clear and nothing like a pictorial you know, <laughs> representation, nothing like that. Um, I think when it comes to going ahead and making that difference at ground level, uh, I think there the sensitivity and the, the, the uh, the desire or the understanding to go back to the drawing board every time you feel that, you know, I'm, I think I'm in the right direction, but why am I not moving? I think yeah. that humility to come back to the drawing board repeatedly and go back to the definition is essential is something, pardon me, I have, I have somebody, <laughs> no drawings every call. somebody agrees <laughs> with you. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, thanks, Meena. Thank you for that. No, thank you, Deepa. What a beautiful question. Thank you. Yes, I'm glad. And we should have maybe asked that earlier. So <laughs> thanks, Deepa. <laughs> so uh, I know we only have three minutes left, but I do have one question, uh, again, from someone who registered. Um, tomorrow's Mental Health Awareness Day. So in the spirit of that and sort of, to, you know, your starting point of view, which was about power, money, and time, and then the whole idea of overwork and all that. So in the context of all of this, what can organizations do to support well-being in a way that's equitable for everyone? Yeah. yeah, so there was a great article that I just posted on LinkedIn from Greater Good. Um, it's a research center in California on, um, on burnout and the actual systemic reasons of burnout. Yeah. So, um, the, the single most impactful thing that an organization can do is to get very honest about the amount of time each job takes, right? If you hire somebody, you are renting their talent for 40 hours a week. You do not own them. And if you pay them more, like you, you still don't own them that doesn't entitle you to more of their time, right? And so if a job can't get done in 40 hours a week, then you need to hire more people or you need to take some, or you need to distribute the workload. And that also means that like, if you're making like six figures or like, I don't know what the equivalent is in Indian rupees, like how they would talk about high income jobs. Um, that also doesn't mean that you like, like the company doesn't own you. You're not, you don't, you, they're not entitled to 60 hours of, of your time a week, right? Um, getting, like doing like time audits of how long it actually takes to do all of the responsibilities listed in a job description is the single best way that you can promote well being in your company right now. That is a super practical and super important <laughs> answer to that very, I think, you know, important, but big question so 
thanks for that yeah. and yeah well because sometimes they get you know one of my one of our consultants they would talk about going for a walk and all these individual things you can do and she's like you realize if i spend an hour walking i have to make up that hour at the end of the day exactly. because you have this at a 90 percent billable rate like this whole system you've designed doesn't allow for like me to be a whole human being mm -hmm. so the only way to present to prevent that is to actually get honest about time and commitment Speaking of being honest about time, we're at yeah. time. So I'm going to ask Pooja if she wants to close out. Or maybe she has some questions for you. Yeah, I've got many, but I'm very <laughs> conscious of time. <laughs> um, so what we can do is, Manal, if you have maybe like five, 10 minutes for whoever mm -hmm. can stay on, we can continue yeah. um, to sort of just close on some questions. But if anybody needs to leave, we understand it's seven o'clock p.m. at least here in India on a Saturday evening. So yeah. you know, feel free to like jump off at any point of time. Before you do that, we do have some information um, about metamorphosis that you can show that you can see on your chat right now. Um, if you'd like to get more information on us, but also there's a link to the book. Uh, so feel free to do that as well. There are a bunch of talks that Minal has online as well. Uh, we put some on our LinkedIn page, so please go ahead and listen to those. They're all very refreshing and kind of gives you a moment to just think about some of these very big terms we use and what they really mean. Uh, so thank you to everyone who has joined us today. I will ask my questions now. I've got two, actually. One is a follow-up from uh, what Deepa asked, and I think some, this thing about equity and equality and when we start at least I know Arthi and I when we start to have these conversations with senior leaders and these are people who are in power who have that ability to change some of that dialogue the first thing you hear is oh oh but it's against merit like that's you no know, everybody is here because you know they they performed it's we're a merit we're merit, meritocratic as an organization we believe strongly in merit um, and so you know changing things to meet different needs may not work so, you know, what's what's your sense? How do you respond to this? Have you heard this in the work that you do? Uh, what advice would you give us? Yeah, I mean, I think Indians love this argument of merit. They really believe in it and it's really problematic. And in the book, I actually talk about it in the introduction and how like my parents coming to this country, a lot of Indian Americans and Asians are held up as like a model minority and um, because we did well and built wealth and were highly educated while other minorities did not in this country. But what is not brought to light is the fact that like my parents and most Indians of their generation benefited from socialized education, which is not available to minorities in this country. And so the equation for success is not just hard work, it's hard work and system support. And so if it's fine to talk about merit, and I understand the need for merit because at the same time that my, you know, my parents came from really humble beginnings and got into medical school based on merit. And there were all like, there were a bunch of people who got into medical school because their parents pulled strings and paid money, right? And like, the, you know, like you never wanted to go to that doctor. You wanted to go to the doctor who got in on merit because India has a socialized education system that made it affordable, right? They didn't have to pay that much every semester. But the equation for success, because it's hard work or merit and system support, what this work is talking about is like, like, yes, hard work. I'm not even going to touch that. What I want to talk to you about is system support. What is the system that's actually supporting your success in addition to your hard work? And please be aware that just because hard work plus system support equals success, it doesn't mean that the corollary is true that if you don't have success, then you weren't working hard. There are a lot of people who are working hard who don't have success because they don't have that fundamental part of system support. Mm. And so that's the part we need to focus on and change. And then it really will be more of a meritocracy where people who work hard will have the system support and be able to um, experience success. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing that and just that equation. <laughs> Um, I think it's really important <laughs> to sort of bring out and talk about more frequently. Um, my other question is really about, you spoke about, um, in the beginning, you spoke about value-based decision-making. Yeah. And we see this a lot, right? All of us have these huge values. Organizations have these values that they talk about. But when you actually look at the, some of the decisions that they're making, it's not really aligned. 
And so I want to talk to you about some conversations that you may have had with leaders or people in power and how have you actually engaged them in this dialogue to say, okay, let's, let's see where these are not aligned, where, you know, just, just yeah. making decisions off of something else, off of the fact that we need to make profit. Yeah, I mean, I'll say that by the time they come to me, they're usually out of that mindset. Um, we do have one client who's probably more in that mindset who is all about a meritocracy. And I think telling, telling stories can be really helpful in terms of giving them another perspective. Um, and then we also always push before, like everybody wants to jump in and do like unconscious bias training and like at the town hall. And I was like, no, I wanna see your DEI vision first. And I wanna know what your organizational values are. And then, I want you to list observable behaviors of those organizational values because values without observable behaviors are, are total bullshit. So that helps them concretize and that helps, like that work needs to be done on the front end. You can't get to the decision and then try to like retroactively get them to change, right? Like it, it's sort of work that needs to be done before decisions are made and you have to let go. When you're in the process of doing this, it's a little bit like putting like, laying tracks down while the train is moving. And so on some level you have to let go if they do make decisions during that process that are not values aligned because you need to sort of lay the tracks for the future for them and get them to understand that instead of shaming them for thing, mistakes they made in the past. And then work on what is it gonna take to be able to actually adhere to this. You know, and that observable behavior thing actually helps them sort of operationalize those values in a much clearer way that should guide decision making in the future. Can you give us an example? I know we've seen the example, but just for the audience, like an example of a value and then what the observable behavior would be. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, there was a, a um, huh, well, let's see, how do I want to say this? Well, I, I mean, the easy one is like, if you say you want to create a, like a health, um, a hospital wants to create an inclusive space, right? Then the observable behavior, like it can't, you can't just tell like healthcare workers, you need to be more inclusive. What exactly do you want us to do differently? And so one hospital is like, in order to be inclusive and rehumanize patients, because there's a long history in medicine of dehumanizing patients, um, you need to refer to address every patient by their name. Mm right? That is the observable behavior we need to see when you're interacting with patients, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and even like with NPR, they wanted to diversify sources. Um, but people were like, what do you actually want me to do differently? Do you want me to hold a story? Like, what do you want me to do? And so we said, okay, for the next year, the observable behavior is you need to track your source diversity. You don't even need to like go and recruit. We just want to track so we have the numbers. And they found that simply by tracking, that raised enough awareness that people did do the work of looking for more diverse sources as well. Mm -hmm. You know, but th there, and then you want to like build upon that, right? Like that might be the first year. And then the second year, like, yeah, we want to make sure that you actually, before you run a story, you have like three sources and, you know, that they're not all of the same identity. Right. So like you build on it slowly because this is like behavior change happens slowly over time when you focus on skill building, not necessarily on like shifting mindsets or getting people to think like you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, yeah, I think I'm done with my questions. So. <laughs> um, maybe one last question if there's anything else from the audience. Yeah, I'm happy to take questions. I'm also happy to like I, you know, I'm not working in India or Asia. So if there are people who want to share even like what obstacles they face um, and like sort of more of the context of where they're working, I would love to hear that as well. Guys, I don't have a question. I mean, I have about like 60,000 questions <laughs> and I'm like, I sit for like three days basically, but like in the span of this, like I'm not, I just wanted to really say I enjoyed this so much and thank you so much. And I'm getting the book right now. And <laughs> it was a wonderful <laughs> conversation. I just enjoyed it so much. Thanks guys for setting it up. I mean, all really nice to, to hear from you and, and meet you here. Thank you, Christy. I appreciate <laughs> that so much. Thank you so much. Okay, you guys take care.
You too. Okay, bye bye. Bye, Christy. Bye. Minal, I don't know if this person is here, but someone had a very profound question, which mm -hmm. we might need to have for the next unmentionables, which was how to make pa the patriarchy system weaker. <laughs> I feel like there's uh, so much in that, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, that's just, like a whole. Other that is a whole other, other session. Topic. No, but since you asked about India-specific barriers, that would be my number one <laughs> barrier. <laughs> no, it you know. You know, because my mom was such a badass, I didn't really think it was as big a problem as I'm because it carries over here to this country. For sure. Hmm. You know, like I see it with like even Indian American, like people like me who are born and raised here, like getting hmm. divorced is such a big deal. Hmm. Not being married is such a big deal. Like the things that parents are agreeing to that their daughters experience is such like nonsense that it's like shocking that it's still going on. So yeah, I would, I would, I mean, I would want to be in conversation with somebody in India about it because it just, it, it varies, but then it does actually travel across borders and land here. Yep. Yeah. You know? And it's all intermixed, right? So it's caste-based patriarchy and religion and all of it comes into play here. So yeah. like we said, there's probably like four separate sessions in that one simple question yeah but yes well if uh, there's no other questions are there no mm -hmm. I think there yeah if anyone wants to just stay in touch with us with Meenal you know we're all I think really welcoming uh, your inputs and your questions in the future so thanks Meenal for being here no thank we you I wanted to say hi Charu I see my friend there Charu also like hi it's so good to see hi. you Sorry I think I Charu, you... no 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 it's okay it's nice to see you all <laughs> same here Charu is the one I have to thank for introducing you to me yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a nice interrelated community building here so I mean, it's more you I can't tell you how much it warms my heart to have so many like Desi <laughs> women in India doing this like yeah, like it just it makes me hopeful that I have some connection to India because like I just it's not through my family so <laughs> like, well, not like, through your blood relatives family yeah your other kind of family <laughs> other family yeah and so it just it means so much to me so thank you all so much how oh, lovely well on that happy note we should probably uh, maybe stop the recording and let everyone